Board of Trustees, Monday, February 4th. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Mayor Wilson? Here. Trustee Bornstein? Uh, here. Trustee Clark? Here. Trustee Koopman? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Here. Trustee Romanello? Here. Trustee Stevens? Here. Before us, we have an agenda and a consent agenda. Is there any modifications or questions in regard to the agendas? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to request to pull out for clarification or discussion on the uh, invoice for the town attorney specific to uh, one of the items uh, regarding Forest Lake PUD. Okay. I'd, I'd like to add to that actually and pull out for discussion the invoice for the town attorney and requests from board members for uh, information uh, individual board me members for information and the costs related to what we have budgeted and how we can better handle that in the future. Okay. I'd also like to revise the agenda for this evening and where is it? Six. Number six. I'd like to know if we could Sorry, Mr. Manning, if we could please postpone the landscape ordinance discussion a little bit longer. Uh, when I downloaded the pages, I realized I didn't have enough time to review it in detail. Okay. So we have the pulling out of the, attorney the attorney's invoice and adding that to the discussion items. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Motion to approve as amended. We have a second. Do we have a second? Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. But we have the planning department discussion also to pull out of there. That will include pulling off the planning department <coughs> landscaping ordinance? Sure. Okay. We take roll, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Bornstein? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Koopman? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. 7-0. Seven, seven okay. First item on the agenda, recognition. Kellen Bryan, Mr. Tharmish. Okay, tonight I would like to take a few minutes to recognize one of Public Works uh, employees based upon the actions that she took uh, following the recent uh, snowstorm. Uh, during this action, she provided assistance to a citizen uh, in a time of need. And let me just give you a little background on Kellen. Uh, Kellen has been an employee, uh, I guess I should call Kellen up here first. Come on, I got myself a little bit. has been an employee for the Town of Monument for over two plus years and has been an outstanding employee. She has been recognized previously amongst her peers as a dedicated exemplary performer as demonstrated by her award at the end of last year as a 2018 employee for the Public Works, outstanding employee for the Public Works Department. Her attitude has always been at the highest level and reflects upon the overall department's goals of providing excellent customer service. The story behind tonight's recognition was brought to my attention by staff as she was performing her normal job duties of trying to clear up the streets after we had these multiple snowstorms. Uh, during that last uh, storm, she was flagged down by one of our residents uh, and asked if she could help, requested assistance 
help clear her driveway because her husband was having a medical issue. And it just so happened she was in that neighborhood. Uh, she did what she always does and was above and beyond and helped clear out this lady's driveway so that she could get uh, her husband some medical attention. Kellen uh, has also uh, been active in a lot of other areas when it comes to helping our citizens, but this is just one uh, fine example of her dedication to supporting our citizens when they need it. So I'd like to congratulate her for that. They go above and beyond. And we talked about customer service. We talked about world-class customer service. And then we're going to supply you with what you want. We're all going to also going to try to supply you with everything you need. And so she's a great exemplary employee and a great example of what our policy is here to provide you outstanding world-class customer service. So let's give her another round of applause. I just want to let you know that I'm the one that flagged oh, you down. Yeah. <laughs> and I was so grateful because I had like, I don't know, two feet of drifts behind the car and there was no way I was going to be able to um, clear that. We're all good. Get a kidney stone. <laughs> item on the agenda presentation public works department report mr tharnish okay, the department presentation before you tonight is uh, similar to what i've done in the past and i try to do this every time we get to board members take a time early in the year just so they can get up to date on the current uh, conditions of where we were, where we are now, what we're looking forward to in the future. Uh, the date on this was dated prior to the last meeting, so I didn't see any point in changing it to the day, but it's the same uh, presentation. Oops. I forgot about that patience thing. Right. <laughs> Press the button. All right, first part is uh, something I always like to make people aware of is our mission statement as a department. That is to provide maintenance and service necessary for the upkeep of the town's infrastructure. Uh, maintenance and repair of the town's streets, parks, cemetery, water systems is all integral to maintaining the necessary services that our citizens expect and enjoy as a productive member of our community. And that's something that all of our crews are to talk to when you first hire them and understand that it's teamwork and the training that they do that that make that happen. Uh, I went back a few years, 15 years to be exact, um, which is even four years after I started here to show you where we came from. At that time, the town was operating, let me catch you up. The town was operating three water treatment plants with a total of eight wells. There's a total of five operators to maintain that system. And a little bit more data on our hydrants, our transmission lines, things like that. Uh, we were also in the middle of coming out of a major rebuild of our dam at the lake that was completed, I believe, in 2002. And on streets and Parkside, We had, this is the equipment that we were operating with. We had uh, different size plow trucks. We had a grader. We still have most of this equipment. Street sweeper, uh, backhoe, back truck, 
and all of our vehicles, including the PD, added up to about 17 of them at that time. As far as facilities go, we have, we still have this, a 150 by 50 shop, and three wooden sheds, and I'll have some pictures of those that we'll thumb through towards the end. Three dates in the 70s, three town parks, and about 15 or so miles of roads that we were responsible to maintain. And to do all that work, we had five people in public works. We had no town gardener. We had two seasonal workers, if the budget would allow it. And then there's a few pictures to show you some of this stuff. This is the public works sheds, or two of those are actually offices. And you can tell they're pretty dated. Uh, we've done improvements in the last year or two to try to maintain them until we can get this new facility built. And, um, and this is that 50 by 50 shop that we maintain uh, mostly as a meeting place. We may have our Wednesday morning training. And we store a lot of parts in there. Things of that nature. And now jumping ahead to where we are now. In 2019, the town is operating four treatment plants with one additional well, nine wells. We still only have five licensed operators. Same amount we had back then to maintain that system. Uh, one water billing admin distribution system, again, broken down into different areas, and an automated bulk water station. And some of the pictures, these came out. This is well number eight. When I started here in the year 2000, this plant was the new plant. It had just come online about a year ahead of, a year ahead of that, and it was the one that I actually trained on to, to work on my water license. So that's been around since about 99, I think, is when it was built. And this is actually uh, two water treatment plants sharing a common wall. The one, as you're looking at that screen to the left, is well number eight. That is the one that's been around since the late 90s. And then the one to the right of it, the lighter tannish color, or I guess it'd be darker tan, is the well treatment plant Three, what we call three and nine. It's only called that because there's two wells that actually feed into that plant. And this is another view. This is looking to the uh, northeast from Second Street. You can see some of the trucks parked there. Um, that's one of our new. In fact, that is our our newest plant. With the exception of the remodeling that we've done, which I'll get to in just a minute. This is what the inside of that building looks like. All those blue pipes you see there are treated water in various uh, process forms before it goes out to the system. Excuse me, it goes out to the system. And this is the one that we spent a lot of time on, a lot of money on lately. Uh, well form five is our uh, alluvium treatment plant. There's two wells that feed this plant. And this plant is the one that's on the, on, uh, has undergone close, I think, 924,000 is what the contract is for. Uh, this is one that was bought secondhand uh, long before I started here, and we spent a lot of money upgrading that with new technology, new valves, new uh, skating controls, things that brings it in line with our other existing water treatment plants. So this is our newest uh, remodeled area. And I know the guys really enjoy the changes from where we were to where we are now. And uh, we'll be providing some tours to that plant as soon as we get to the range for the public to see. And then this one here is well number seven. This plant is what we call our high pressure water treatment plant. If you go on Highway 105, just down from this building here, right outside the windows, you see that blue building off to the side of the road. That plant operates uh, at much higher pressure than all our others. It is the only plant we have that can send water uh, directly to the top of Monument Hill to our tank. All the other ones need our booster station, which is outside the building here in the corner. 
to boost that pressure up. This one operates at a high enough pressure that it can put water into that tank without a boost. All right, the streets and parks, where we are today. Other words, equipment and vehicles. That uh, new large plow truck is now two years old, actually. It's 2017 when that was purchased. We have two medium trucks that date back to 2004, 2013. And we have a couple of smaller ones. Uh, same road grader we've had since 1988. We just do our best to keep the maintenance up on that. Uh, two street sweepers. You can see that on list there and various equipment, and we were up to 34 vehicles, and that would include the PD vehicles. Okay, facilities. Uh, we made one addition in 2005. We added a 60 by 120 foot shop. Uh, that's a shop that you'll see a picture of here shortly that we, we uh, severely outgrew. And that was part of the driving force behind trying to get a new facility funded and built. There's the same three sheds that we had all along, a little bit more mileage, uh, and then we have a, one extra park, but it's all, that, all in, the, in the new park, what we call Park Hill Park, is just a small playground, and uh, not much there. That's, that's pretty open for development, which is what we discuss as staff, and we can come to the board at some point with some plans. Uh, one trailhead facility, that is fairly new to us. Uh, we tra that got transferred to us from El Paso County Parks. Uh, the county went through a phase a few years ago where they were trying to, um, trying to downsize what their maintenance was going to be. And they came to us and did what they call a quick claim deed. They deeded the town about 10 to 11 acres with control of their uh, facility right there along 3rd Street what we call the trailhead facility. And we put a lot of money into that recently. We installed irrigation there and uh, did some improvements. Um, so hopefully we'll keep working on that to make it better for people who use that trail every single day. And then the skate park, the same skate park. Been there for quite a while. There's a lot of use in the summertime. Not so much now since it's pretty snowy. Relocated Boat Fill Station. We had a boat fill station in, a, in one of the subdivisions when it first got built, which is where it was designated to go uh, many years before the first homes were built there. But once the facility was built and uh, loading on it became uh, a problem, and the neighborhood over there came to us and <coughs> asked us to move that, and it took a few years to uh, work a, a deal, I guess, with the sea. CDOT allowed us to put it on the property, which is over by the Arby's. So if you ever see where the Arby's and the Conco station is in town, you'll see this little same facility there. We just put it on a truck and moved it. We moved the water lines into it. Uh, this is a, a valuable asset to the town, especially for a lot of people that live up on what we call the Mesa area. And that area has uh, a hard time drilling wells. That's where all of our boat, majority of our boat water customers come from. That area, they have to haul water a couple times a week. We also allow uh, commercial entities to fill from there, but they're, they're pretty strict about the rules. Um, there's two ways to fill from the top or from the side. So I thought I'd give you a picture of what that, what that looks like. And here's some other pictures, just various pictures. This is the uh, 50 by 50 shop, and behind it is that bigger shop. Um, you'll see some pictures coming up of what the inside of those look like. Here's that one of those pictures right there. That's at 60 by 120. Uh, what we typically uh, have in there, it's, it's jam packed. In fact, I would imagine we have more equipment outside than on the inside, just because there's no storage. Dirty one on park. Uh, looking north. Uh, what you see in front of you there is the uh, horseshoe pits and the volleyball, and then in the distance you'll see the pavilion, which is rented out almost every weekend in the summer. 
for various events, whether they're anniversaries, or graduation parties, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of those huge willows you see on the right side of the picture, uh, a lot of those willows are going to be coming down over the next several years. Um, they're hollowed out, they're pretty much rotten on the inside, it's just a structure that's holding them. So every time we have these high wind events, like we've had the last few days, Mark Storman and his crew go out and inspect and see if there are any branches that need to be removed coming down. We've been planting a lot of our trees for the Hat Town's annual Arbor Day. Uh, get planted in that area to try to regrow those before we end up having to get rid of all of them. That's an ongoing issue that we deal with every year. Uh, and those roads are probably 150 years old. Now the park looking north. This is one of our more colorful parks. That's right down the road from the Beacon Light here. <coughs> uh, Beacon Light, and that's an area there that our town uh, gardener and landscape supervisor now is Cassie will get that planted out and then uh, Kevin assists her all the time with that. So they do a pretty good job team on these flowering uh, areas. That's a typical summer look that you see there. Limbaugh Park is probably one of our more heavily used parks at the corner of front and second. And that is before we planted. And you can see it in the summer, it's very colorful in that area also. And that park is rented out quite a bit. So I've got some future planning a little bit. And a lot of this is stuff that we have um, managed to get into our budget as we move forward. You'll see that a uh, new second water storage tank, which we're actively working on or trying to get um, set along where it's going to go. A reuse system is always going to be there. Uh, interconnects, there are plans to do that also. Uh, some of that in conjunction with reuse and renewable. There's an upgrade in our booster station. Again, that's a choke point for our system. It sends all the water in the tank. So we try to uh, keep that up with today's technology. Uh, we're going to be installing an aeration system in Monument Lake this year. And that's going to help not only with uh, increasing the fisheries, but it's also going to help prevent, um, or help one of the factors that help us prevent uh, from getting algae blooms in that lake, which is always a concern. So we control the nutrients in there through some chemicals, and we're going to add an aeration system, which will help with that. And I don't mean it's not, it's not going to be like a bunch of fountains you see coming out of the lake. If you're out on the lake, what you'll see is some little eddy currents moving around as it bubbles up from the bottom. Uh, that'll be, that's in the budget for this year. And then the long way to bathrooms. Um, those will be permanently installed. We're still discussing whether we're going to be able to put some, you know, I should say, we're, we're discussing the type of bathrooms that are going to need to go. So we've got a few more answers to get from some of our suppliers. Streets and Parks, uh, New Park Works Facility, that's what we've been working on, uh, uh, trying to get an architect lined up for that and get a design going. Uh, aging equipment as necessary, develop that new Park Trail Park. I believe our town manager wants us to put a project in there this year. So we're going to work on that. Replacing our fleet as necessary. We have a fleet maintenance plan that we follow, so every year we have a certain number of vehicles in the budget to, to get rid of and get rid of the older stuff. Uh, new sidewalks, 105 and Beacon Light north to the trail. That, that project came about as a um, request from a bunch of citizens, I remember about two years ago, that they were having trouble, trouble getting the <coughs> Central Main subdivision with somebody in a wheelchair. And they couldn't get up across the road because there's no ADA route to do that. So we've been in the works trying to figure out the best way to make that work, and we came across some uh, some budget, um, budget, some grant funding through the planning department and us. We're going to work in the conjunction. Uh, that's most likely going to happen uh, late summer, early fall, and when the funding arrives. Uh, well, that's rather going to be a, a massive project. Um, that's bringing sidewalks basically from the trailer park all the way down to the corner. Cut the corner a little bit because that corner is a little dangerous and all the way up to Safeway. <coughs> And then across the street will be sidewalks from uh, the corner where the Dollar Tree is, all the way up to uh, where the 7-Eleven is. So basically there'll be a walking path on the sidewalk from the Walgreens area all the way back this way. 
So that's a pretty major project. Most of it's funded through grants, and we'll have to provide some matching funds. We already budgeted for that. So that's exciting news. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions from the board? Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Sure, Tom. <coughs> <clears throat> December 2, 2018, pre-audit financial report. Ms. Smith. Um, you all received a copy for sure of the board packet of the fourth quarter financials and the pre-audit financials. These numbers will change because at the time this was done, it was on the high November and we be sending the sales tax in here. We're going to be higher than what the budget last year. And uh, everything else, revenue wise, is in there pretty much. And then expenditures, anything that we spend that is for 2018, that we get an invoice in January or February of 2019, will be put back into 2018 as an audit provision. So uh, they're rough numbers, but, but they're close to what you're going to see. <coughs> if anything we would expect. Revenues to go up more than they have. So, are we available for any questions? Any questions from the board? Thank you, Ms. Mann. Planning Department Annual Report, Mr. Manning. <laughs> well, it's a uh, Mr. Tarnish is a tough act to follow, <laughs> especially when your department has no uh, public improvements that it specifically does and shows pretty pictures of. So, <laughs> let me say what I can say about our department. And uh, this uh, short, brief presentation, I'm going to show you our, kind of what our personnel makeup is in the department, their basic duties, uh, and then about the processing of permits and the data surrounding how many we have issued. Uh, and then talk about a few special projects. Aha. There we go. Okay, so it's a little bit small for the audience to see, but this is the four people in the planning department. The administrative assistant who is new this year. Uh, does a lot of the permit work uh, and also assists with the planning commission meetings and more importantly uh, she's been going over our uh, permit process and the uh, Excel spreadsheets we use for that and getting us in a lot better shape to work totally electronically and uh, if you don't know the various developments we have around the town all have different parameters so you can't just say this development is $20,000 factory because the drive they made a, made a deal to build a water tank and so they're not paying the tap fee. So each development pretty much has one tailored to itself and she's been very helpful at getting that. <coughs> the engineering assistant, uh, he's in the field most of the time. He reviews the civil designs for development plans and inspects construction both private sector as well as public if we have a project where overlaying the road. Uh, he's out there making sure, making sure it's done right. Uh, he also helps uh, try to do Metro with their projects. Uh, this year they overlaid a bunch of roads and he was out there making sure they have the right product, the right thickness, uh, and the right process to get it done. <clears throat> he also is in charge of stormwater, which is a bigger deal than maybe you would think in terms of keeping track of all our detention ponds tracking their condition and making sure they get cleaned out adequately so we don't get the state down here hounding us on that. Senior planner, um, she's mostly involved in processing the development requests. Um, that would be things you see, whether it's a site plan or an annexation or um, rezoning. So she'll do a lot of application meetings. Um, she'll enter the electronic files, get these things going and have ongoing comments and conversations with the uh, developers uh, and uh, then prepare the reports for the planning commission and for yourselves. Uh, the planning director, myself, 
I manage, manage those personnel and oversee their tasks, uh, do get involved in the more uh, contentious, if you will, or involved or lengthy uh, development requests using the annexations. Um, anything that's kind of out of the norm that comes through the department. Uh, I also coordinate a lot with other agencies. I think you heard Tom say or talk about some grant funds that will, they will come from PPACG. So I attend the TAC meetings, Transportation Advisory Committee, and start talking about when they're going to throw some money our way. Um, and behind all these, you'll see et cetera. Because with the small staff, sometimes we will end up doing what the administrative assistant is doing. I will, or vice versa, or we'll do them together. So try to cross train as much as we can in that regard. So we keep things moving, we'll keep them on vacation. Um, okay, processing of permits, land use permits. That's the main permit we issue. Uh, that has to go with uh, the building plans to the building department for them to be able to get an actual building permit. Most of them are single family homes, uh, but we do issue them also for commercial developments. Uh, at that time, we collect fees, impact fees, and the use tax. The land development permits are for overlap trading, primary <coughs> development, uh, landscaping, sidewalk tree removal, etc. Some of the smaller permits. Uh, here's some information on that. The main thing I want to point out is in the left column, not the total hole at the left, but the purple column towards the left, you can see if you examine that over the last three years, our permit issuance for our land use permits has been pretty consistent at 180 plus per year. Again, most of those are uh, residential, single family. Here's some data on the other types of permits. It's a little more sporadic because of the nature of them. People put up a lot of fences one year and don't put a whole lot up the next. Development applications. We received 34 in 2018, uh, resulting in 60 plus thousand in submittal fees. Um, nine requests were commercial projects. The balance were residential. It did include townhomes and apartments. Um, followed up and closed numerous 2017 developments in 2018. Most of them go over a year. Uh, if not a year long, they at least go from one year to the other before we're done meeting with them at the beginning and by the time it actually gets to you. And even after that, we have more duties to do. So. <coughs> Special projects, this one's a little hard to read as well, but I wanted to mention some. Some of them cross over to Public Works because, as Carl mentioned, we work together primarily on funding we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for the funding to help them out with these projects. <clears throat> so uh, I mentioned the Triview Road construction projects and what we did to help them out. Um, the Front Street and Second Street, and I think that uh, Tom mentioned that. If not, it was the section that goes to third along front, from second to third. And that was an in-field design by our engineering assistant. Just working with the contractor, working with what he found out there, and did not have to have an engineer design to get it done. Uh, there's some paving at the public works facility that he oversaw. Design and construction of the parking lot at the water building department. Uh, water line looping and storm sewer project from the north end of the Lake of the Rockies development to Third Street. Uh, the town road improvement projects that town conducts every year. He's involved in that to uh, make sure the uh, project is going well, done with good materials and with good uh, methods. The sidewalk design, again, uh, we're involved with Tom on making sure we can get that funding from the federal government to get an 80-20 mass, so they will pay 80%, we'll pay 20. Screening wall, uh, coordination of uh, Jack Street Parkway widening. If you didn't know, uh, Tideview intends to do that this year, up to Higby, which is their responsibility, just to Higby. Uh, we are working with the county to see what they're going to do about the intersection, because it's there under their control. But we're working mostly with Tribe right now to implement a transition, since we can't afford at this point to do four lanes all the way to 105. We'll create some kind of a transition from the four south of Higby back to the two north of the uh, high school. 
Um, we worked on some planning and design work for the bridge over Monument Creek that would connect, connect Synthes to uh, Baptist Road. Uh, and we worked with the coordination of the National, National Gas Service for the industrial, light, <coughs> industrial lands excuse me, along I-25 and south of Baptist Road. So north and south of there is all industrial. Uh, came to light that there is no natural gas supply in that whole area. So the developers are now talking about who's going to pay for what and get the natural gas company Black Hills on it to implement some plan where all of that gas can become available to those industrial properties. And that's it. Any questions? Questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Enhance the public hearing notification process and community engagement. Mr. Manning. Yeah, I wanted to mention first what we currently have on the books and what we do for every project. There we go. So we advertise in the newspaper. At this point, it's the Gazette. Um, a minimum of 15 days prior to the in hearing that's going to occur. We post a sign, on or in the vicinity of the development, multiple locations are used for large sites. Uh, we have certified mail sent to the property owners within 500 feet, and neighborhood meetings when we feel they're necessary. some possible improvements we can make. We could pick up a local paper if we have one. I think we might. That's out weekly. If it's out monthly, it really slows down our process. Um, so that would be one way we could maybe get some more information out. We could increase the size of our placards and postings. Right now they're 18 by 18 by 20. And we could go to 24 by 36, just so they're a little larger. And you'll see in my next slide that some people are even bigger than that. Um, can increase the distance that people are notified around the property, require more neighborhood meetings, notify all the homeowners association in the vicinity of development if there are any. Because we do have areas in town where there may have been a homeowners association at one time and they're not currently operating. So this slide we have a little comparison of various towns we felt were similar and it tells you what their notice and requirements are. There's one that is less, most are 15 days. Uh, the postings range from our size to uh, as large as 48 by 48. And the distance goes anywhere from just those abutting to a thousand feet. <coughs> and so what I'd be looking for from the board is some direction as to what you might want to do specifically. Uh, if you want us to do some more research and then anything particular, we'll do that as well. One of the things that I tasked him with was in response to your um, request was can we come up with some enhancements to our publication no notifications. And so these are some of the ideas that Larry came up with in his staff. And so we're just looking for some direction from you on are these some ideas that you think are positive? Uh, would you support these? And then, uh, you know, are there some others that you've thought about? I think they're very positive. I would support all of them. Just, just to support, and again, thank you, Mr. Manning. Uh, you know, I think this is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we have to follow guidelines on zoning ordinances and what have you. But I just think people want to feel that their voice is heard doesn't mean it's going to change the world, but it's so important. I think this is great because over the years, we've always followed other cities. I don't think we need to follow other cities. I think that slide can go away. I think we set our own standards for our community. But, but I do think this is a good move forward. Very good. So thank you. I think they're all great options. I, I really like the uh, increased size of the, of the sign. My wife was down in Oklahoma City. Uh, last uh, December and she had said you know they notify 
with these massive signs. She said, it's like a three foot by four foot banner saying this is what's coming. This is the public hearing date. And I don't know if it needs to be that extreme, but compared to some of the signs that I've seen with some of the projects, I think, I think size is a, a, a great approach. Um, and in addition, maybe integrating the, the tech system. Um, I know uh, that's up and running again uh, with notifications of meetings. I don't know how to incorporate that into the, uh, the notification of the public. Um, this is what's coming. This is when that community meeting is. You know, this is how you contact us for input. So great options. Definitely. Thank you. I think that if we, this is all about people's voices being heard, um, in addition to the more noticeable advertising, perhaps a varied schedule with neighborhood meetings so that once the kids are off to school, the moms can attend, and when the dad gets home or vice versa, whatever the situation is, then the mom can stay with the kids or the dad can stay with the kids and the other can attend the meetings. So maybe if there's flexible schedules for the neighborhood meetings and not just 7 p.m. on a Wednesday or whatever the usual is, that might help. That's one thing we're looking at is multiple meetings so that you have a couple different options you know, to be able to go to. Do you feel you have something to work with, or would you like more specific guidelines? I think we're good. We come back with uh, what we think the specifics would be. Okay. Yep. And uh, see if that's adequate. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Next item on the agenda, resolution. Resolution number 03-2019, a resolution initiating annex and setting a hearing date for the Board of Trustees of the Town Monument to consider annexation of an area known as Willow Springs Number 1 and Willow Springs Number 2. Mr. Manning. Thank you. Are we ready yet, Laura? No. Do you have a... Okay, there may not be anything for this particular presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this is a resolution that will set a public hearing for this annexation. Um, at that public hearing, we'll examine the details and, uh, of the annexation agreement, the sketch plan, uh, and uh, go over those intently with you and prepare a report as we did before. Um, at this particular time, we're looking for you simply to uh, uh, set that hearing date, which we're calling as March 18th which gives us time, as you'll note in the resolution, to do all that advertising and notification that's required by state law. Any questions from the board on setting a date? A couple questions. Um, I, for one, I'm, I'm glad to see this back. Definitely had some questions. I know I bounced uh, uh, to our, our interim town manager here, uh, which he had said uh, Mr. Rivera will, will probably answer. I know we spent a, a sizable amount of money on determining which um, points of the uh, annexation process need to be reapplied, what don't. I'd like to know what the, the findings were uh, based on this packet. It looks like they didn't reapply. No. So um, this is actually a project that predated me a little bit, um, but uh, I picked it up and it was identified as a priority and, and I reviewed all of the, all the documents and uh, walked through the, the previous timeline and um, basically I was asked one question, where do we start this process over again? And, and the options were um, to basically have a motion to reconsider, um, to find a, a process somewhere um, in the middle, of, and to start at the very beginning. So, uh, and so let me talk about the process. The process for annex petition, annexation by petition is that the um, landowners basically ask to be annexed, and that has already happened. And then there is a, uh, what's be, being asked of you today, which is to essentially approve uh, the posting requirements and the setting of a hearing schedule. And then at next, the next step is to actually have a hearing, and then you'll make some findings regarding whether uh, the annexation meets the legal requirements. And then the next step is to actually approve the annexation agreement. And, and so the reason why I, I thought we needed to, we couldn't just do a motion to reconsider and, and start at the very end where we ended the process last time is because of the notion of public notice. So I thought it would be best for public noticing purposes to basically start back at the public noticing period put all of the notices back in papers, let all of our community <coughs> partners know, all of the local governments who have shared boundaries with us know, so that they um, are aware of it um, and, and are able to come to the hearing that is scheduled. Had we, had, had we just basically had a motion to reconsider, I think that there was the possibility that, um, that, that someone had been following this previously and had been following it back in October of 2018, thought it had met its demise and kind of assumed that it, it was over. 
and it would be a surprise to them if we had just kind of re had it reappear. So uh, uh, my suggestion was to re-notice everybody so that everybody knows about it and can uh, can attend and, and come speak and, and have their voice be heard at the at the hearing. And my question more so goes to the, the reapplication process. So are you suggesting that there doesn't have to be uh, a refiling of the petition signed from 2017? There doesn't have to be a refiling of that in order to hear this again, even though it was already addressed and we're not doing a motion to reconsider. So we're essentially doing a new public hearing and a new vote, which is great, mm -hmm. but where did the, the point in the process happen where they resubmitted that petition? Um, basically, for all intents and purposes, they resubmitted this petition to us. Um, um, I, I guess is the best way to think of it. I, the the annexee, or the would-be annexee, is very interested and keen on being annexed. And, and so we relied on their represent, representations that they want to be annexed, and they are resubmittal of the previous annexation paperwork. And I found no reason to have them basically go through the pro forma exercise of basically saying we want to be annexed. Um, and I thought that it was reasonable to rely upon the previous um, annexation petition and then just begin the notification process again. I guess what I'm looking for is the where was the point, where was the, the form, the, the formal resubmission to bring this back. And if there wasn't one, then my question would be really, why did we even do this again since this was initially brought up and even approved back in 2008? Fair enough. So, okay. I mean, we, we made them do it once. Why aren't we following um, the full process, I guess? I, I don't think it was necessary to ask them to resubmit the, the paperwork. I think that they've rep uh, represented to us that they're very much interested in, in annexing and, and being annexed, um, and, and they want that to happen. And so the, the next step in the process is for the public body to accept that petition and find it meets the, the legal requirements. Um, and, and so then the question becomes, I think your question is, why do we start at step two as opposed to step one? Is that um, or, or where did step two come from? Okay. Was there an email? Was there a phone call? Was there a meeting? When did the action? When was there, the action was taken? There yeah. was a letter. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> okay. So I guess that's what I'm asking. A is, is there a letter or some sort of saying saying yes, we would like this to be reconsidered? B can you provide that to us? Uh, not at this moment. I don't have it with me. Right. So I, I would like yes, to see yes. that, and then absolutely yes. I see where you come in to say let's do that. Yes. I was looking for that point in the mm -hmm. timeline on when that action happened. Yes, there was, I, have, I, have, I, have, uh, I believe I've seen those emails, something to the effect of from the fellow from, uh, <coughs> uh, from the developer who wants to face the annex. Great. And he's made representations, and Mr. Manning will get those to you. How would you like that transmitted? Email is fine. Yeah, I mean, if you want to share, I'd say the full board, absolutely, board. with the quality of information. Okay Definitely. Just for me to there. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Do we have? Not really a question, but um, comment, I guess, uh, as you prepare the, the next uh, set of information for us. It sounds like the details are coming. Um, when you prepare that, it's my understanding that the state requires or that statute requires uh, a current impact report. Um, something that I felt last time around uh, was a little vague and hopefully I can compel you to be a little bit more specific was and I'm not going to talk about water we beat that to, to death before on that one but really the impact of this development and the size of this development on the local school districts um, it's no surprise that we have a, a struggling school district in, in regards to the growth that we've seen here in our community um, and being that one of the requirements is to not only get an estimated student count, but what is the fiscal impact uh, for each student bringing this development. And I'd really like to, to compel to not just do the, the minimum uh, as far as what you're supposed to present us, but really to, to interact with the school district and see what kind of impact this is actually going to bring to our community in relation to how we educate our kids. They have been deeply involved because there, in fact, is a dedication of five acres from this property, not in the annexed area, to the school district, and they know that will offset some of their fees in lieu. Right. So that arrangement's already occurred between the developer, the town, and the school district. So they're very familiar with this, uh, and they have, I believe, what they want out of the uh, transaction, if you will, since their land will not be annexed. So I, I, again, as you prepare that impact report, I, I'd compel you to, to interact with it. Perhaps a, a blessing from the school district saying we can support 
you know, this many new students and an actual sure. estimate number of how many students. I may already have that. Perfect. Question, if they developed in the county, would they still be in the same school district? Oh, yeah. It's okay. not the same borders as the town. So I'd like to see the difference on the effect has on the school district, whether they develop where they're at in county property or where they're at as town property. That'd be great. Well, right now, they have 10 acres of the total 15, 10 and 5. 10 is already outside the town, and uh, Forest Lakes uh, Water District is prepared to serve water, so it was thought that the entire parcel would be better than one or the other. And I believe the other parcel is already in the district, in their district, which doesn't allow us necessarily to take over. <coughs> so, okay. I think that's... I assume that would be the answer is it wouldn't really make a difference rather county or yeah annex really was up to the school okay. how they wanted to handle it and I remember that dialogue as far as allowing that school site to be in the district within uh, and not within the town I'm more so looking at the the ability to educate this number of students uh, rather than I guess the, the land that's going to be given for a potential school now, I think, as you stated, that that's information that's probably best coming from the school district. Bingo. They're pretty much in tune with that. Uh, we are we from the outside, maybe on. I'll see if I have something already, and if it needs to be enhanced, we'll work on that. Absolutely. I just, I just had one question, Mr. Mayor. You just said, and I just want to make sure I understood. So, under the projection, Forest <laughs> Lakes would be supplying water for the school? <laughs> Did I understand that correctly, or maybe I just heard you wrong? The entire piece of 15 acres, five of which is coming off of this annexation land, but not being annexed. Okay. Well, we join the other 10, they will all be in the Forest Lakes District and served with Forest Lakes water. Okay. Sanitation, I assume, too. Okay. And, and, and I'm sure, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to get on water either. But obviously, things that have transpired, projects that Mr. Thornish is working on has changed the whole portfolio as far as water availability and what have you. So hopefully that'll be addressed. Because my biggest question was, you know, based on 300 houses, 400 houses, whatever it is, I'm sure the numbers are there for the consumption of water. And right now, based on that and based on what we have, what is there, what what will we have an ownership for? And, and, and I, that's a question that's going to be asked, so just a heads up. And I'm sure that the landowner, developer, has that information. Well, Mr. Thomas has a lot of that information as well. But, but, but absolutes, we, because we're, kind of, we're a little generic, but we'll wait. We'll wait till the hearing. So, But it is, that question is going to be asked. I think there's absolutes. Yeah, okay. We've, we've been working on that. We've been working on that, me and Tom. Any okay. other with questions the, about, in regards to setting, setting the date? I make a. I was say I make a motion uh, to approve resolution number three dash twenty nineteen resolution initiating annexation and setting a hearing date for the board of trustees of the town of Monument to consider annexation of an area known as Willow Springs number one and Willow Springs number two. Second. We have a motion and a second. Miss Hogan. Trustee Bornstein. Yes. Trustee Clark. Yes. Trustee Koopman. Yes. Trustee Romanello. Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Discussion items Third Street Arch Safety Concern, Mr. Tharnish. Actually, Mayor, can I ask Mr. Thornish a question on this on what we'll be discussing? And he might address it. I'm just curious, why is the archway on Third Street when it seems like the central hub to come into town is Second Street? Before, you before us. We, 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 perfect we, answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have a committee working on that right now. She's sitting right over here. All right, I set the stage. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, sir. Here in, uh, in 2000, Second Street didn't exist. There was nothing on the field. There was nothing. You had to go... Uh, Beacon Light ended at 2nd Street. He had to go west, all the way down to Jefferson, and then go down and back up Santa Fe, and then Old Denver. That's where the road changed his name. Beacon Light to Old Denver is right there at Santa Fe. And there was nothing but a field, and there was a well house out in the middle of the field where well number three is, and so it was a nice looking vacant lot. 
But since then, we call it the Second Street Extension. We're connected to the, and I don't know if that was the same project where they redid the bridge. When they redid the bridge back in the early 2000s, they basically built a new bridge. That might have been the time when that Second Street Extension really was put in. So the arch has been up since, best we can tell, mid to early 90s. But it was up way before that Second Street building. So that, that's basically your history answer. So just a part two question. As Second Street went through, and that's the main fairway, was there ever a project or a vision to maybe take that archway and go and move it? It was. What happened? It just kind of got to the point where we started talking about can we put that in a budget one year or not, and what it would cost, did it need to be redesigned, or did we just move the arch? Uh, but it never really came before the board throughout the years for uh, an actual uh, vote. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to be working with the citizens and, and some of our community organizations also to, to find out where the best location is for an arch. It may not be this arch, it may be another arch. So we'll be presenting that to you. All right. Here's a pass out. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about tonight is the current status of the <coughs> arch and some serious safety concerns <coughs> that we have. What I'm going to give you here is an engineering uh, visit that we had. It was actually dated September of 2017. It talks about the concerns. And I'm going to show you some of this, and I'm going to show you a little bit of video. Yeah, about 30 seconds of video. Get the wind. Get the wind. We had some video from quite a while ago, and then yesterday when we were going really hard, uh, I went out and filmed some more. So that's what. Okay. All right, and then the other thing I want to do is stand back here so I can. That, point out some things. that clicker's not going to work for this, but you're just going to have to tell me what you want up there because it's okay. wanting to cycle through all the pictures. Okay. It's not going to help, but <laughs> let me know what you want me to put up and all. All right. Yeah. I'll try to get it to work. Okay, so put the picture. Now, it should be on all the screens, not the video, the picture. There you go. This one in particular, I happen to take right from the... Uh, um, post office, I believe, looking south. And what I want to point to you out is this is when we were having the high winds. If you look at that, the report says there was a six inch deflection back in 2017. And I didn't get up there measured, but my guess is that's way more than six inches at the top. And that was with the 40 mile an hour plus winds yesterday. Now would imagine it looked just like that today with this morning. Uh, so now I'm going to show you a little video. She brings that up. I think it'll eventually start. I never heard it so yeah. silent in here. <laughs> no moving at all. Right. <laughs> Let me try something else here. Miss Hogan, over this arch, bottom left. And it comes down. Is there a play here. button? It shows. There it is. And that Thank you. Constantly oh. being loose. There's the video. Oh. That's cool. Oh. You can see it's way, and that's I think from Walgreens looking north. Oh, you nice. can see how what's happening every time this cyclical loading occurs, where it's attached with bolts on the bottom is a concern because sooner or later you get enough bending and constant motion. We don't know whether it could give away all of a sudden or start cracking. Anyway, it's become enough of a concern that I pulled out the old report and went over this with their town manager. And they talked, so as you read some of these bullets in there, that uh, one of the main concerns is the fatigue in the structure created by the cyclical wind loading. Uh, well quality is poor, does not meet typical construction requirements, which can compromise the strength of the structure. Basically, the welds could be cracked and not visible on the surface. 
Uh, they did identify there's additional testing you could do if you want to go down that path. Um, one of the big concerns is we have no idea how uh, deep the bolts that are holding this are into the uh, support structure. When we look to try to find uh, construction drawings or things when we put in, <coughs> went down the regional building, see if permits were ever pulled, regional has no record of that at all. They were kind of surprised that it was put up without their end. Um, <laughs> so, obviously you can see the concern is if this thing falls. And if we're lucky enough, if it falls, it falls in the middle of the night, nothing happens, but if it falls during the day, and some car goes by, to me, as a, as a director, that represents a, a huge liability. Sure. So I, my, my opinion is of that we need to remove this arch, and then the board at some point can figure out how they want to do in, in the future with a new arch or something of that effect. Uh, I don't know who specifically put it up. I've heard rumors that somebody in the Seidel family back then, in the 90s, <coughs> who used to be a former mayor here. Um, but the concern is that the wells, there's no way to tell unless we do extensive testing. Uh, there's a question as to how deep the bolts are going into the support stanchion there. So that's what I wanted to present to you tonight was uh, to see if we can't take that out for safety reasons. This right here is a, is a conduit that runs down. There's actually an outlet on the end of it. It used to be mounted to this. And we tried mounting it different methods. If you get enough wind here with this loading, it breaks loose. So if you go out there now and the wind's blowing, you'll see this conduit sticking out of the mountain just kind of moving the same way the wind does. And another concern, and if it calls it out in this report or not, but on the north side, um, there's a cable line that's actually attached to this, and there's power lines right above it, as you can see. So even taking this down is going to be a, a contractor-driven safety that should probably require a road, a road, a road closure uh, to take it down. So I thought I'd show you what's out there. If you ever notice, if you're driven by it, you can stand there for a few seconds. You know, <coughs> make your heart go a little bit better. Hmm. John, what so we're close. looking for is some direction. When do you want to take it down? You know, we, I, my advice is as soon as possible. We should get some quotes on cost. cost. Totally agree. Right. Totally we will. agree. We'll get three quotes. Yeah. On that. Board and agreements. Yes. 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 How okay. quick turnaround? Can Especially. We get on Tom, what do you think on that? How quickly can we get something by the nineteenth? Um. Yeah, we quotes. could. I mean, if we if we call some some companies that do this type of work and tell them we have we have an immediate need and give us a quote. I would imagine that you could. That's basically a construction. That's going to be my goal is to get you something on the 19th. Other than the height. And when that goes close, we're going to have to coordinate with uh, Mountain View Electric because these power lines are awful close on this side of the arch. Yeah, I was and wondering about those power lines. That's one that's got actually an arm attached with a, a graphic and the cables running right through. Can we address what to do with it after it's taken down? Yes. Will you bring that back to the board? We'll bring it back to you. Yeah, we're currently trying to contact the family that put it up and see if there's any need for them to take it to a farm or a ranch or something like that. And then uh, because I think, like Tom said, uh, if we go to take it down, we're probably going to have to take it down in pieces. And so we read a report that said it may be bolted together, but we know that we saw some welds there, and so we're going to have to cut welds and stuff like that. And so all of that will come out in the next meeting. Okay. Okay. And Chief, this is this explains why people are going really fast down Third Street. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you're going out of the post office. <laughs> Any additional questions for Mr. Thomas? How, how close is that sign to those power lines? Do you know? The arch? Yes. Oh, it's within a couple of feet. Mm. My guess is the uh, NBA will have to cut power in order to get something in there to move that particular side of it. It's amazing it hasn't. Gone well, it's one of those things you don't really think about until you get a high wind event. And then, mm -hmm. then I start looking at old drawings and old reports that we generated. It just looks. 
Well, from what I remember several years ago, it looks like that, that six inch lean is not six inches more. And that's all due to the constant wind load and it's all stressing at that point where it attaches. One of the other things we're working with, we're working with the chamber and some of the arts groups about what's next, where, where we're gonna put a new arch. What's the arch gonna look like and stuff like that. So you'll see a committee formed and put together and we'll come up with ideas and bring those back to you also. Thank you, Mr. Starnish. Town Attorney Invoice, uh, Trustee Koopman, will you start us off? I think you had the first comment about that. Absolutely. Um, so I noticed the, uh, the objection to Forest Lake PUD and then about $2,700 worth of work done on that. And then I, it, I realized I don't know what the town is formally objecting in Forest Lakes, and I think if we're <coughs> spending thousands of dollars formulating a formal objection, uh, my biggest concern is um, who authorized that and what are we objecting? Okay, no problem. So uh, that was one of the projects that was identified to me upon my uh, swearing in as a high priority project. It was identified to me as such by Bob Crossa, the town's water attorney and uh, the interim town manager. Um, in essence, what's going on is that uh, the objection is essentially a reservation of rights. The developer of Forest Lakes has submitted with the El Paso County, um, uh, El Paso County a request to develop the area. Um, what that, that PUD, uh, Public uh, Plan Unit Development, did not adequately recognize, in, in my opinion, and in Bob Cross's opinion as well, is the uh, previous uh, water rights held by the town. So essentially the town has subterranean water rights throughout that entire area. Yeah, and what's at issue is essentially uh, how the town will access those water rights. And specifically what's at issue is, is um, um, the, for lack of a better word, the dedications that, that the developer will give to the town to provide adequate land to, uh, ha to basically construct and maintain drilling operations to access that water. Um, and that's been an ongoing dispute for some years. And, and when I was brought on board, it was made clear to me that this PUD had been submitted to the county um, and that there was a deadline, I believe, of, um, I don't recall the deadline, late December, and I had a, only a few, uh, a week or so to work on it and, and submit by the deadline an objection to reserve the town's rights so that the PUD w uh, was not approved in, in absence of any kind of um, uh, recognition of the town's rights. Uh, the reason why it was... Um, so expensive, it was, it was quite a lot of work, frankly. Um, I had to look at various conveyances going back several years and, and basically understand the property right at issue um, and then, and then uh, educate myself as, as to the county's PUD process and then draft a, an objection all the while working with Bob Crossa because it was a fairly, well, I leaned a lot on him in terms of for water law substantive help because of their, um, I understand very well how to reserve rights regarding an easement, which is what, what essentially it is. I needed a lot of help in terms of how to explain and understand water law and how we, how basically why we had as a town uh, the right to the subterranean uh, water. And it sounds like I would agree with probably almost everything that you said regarding that objection. I guess my biggest concern mm -hmm. and what I'm highlighting here, I'm not, I'm not objecting your charge. Um, <coughs> there's no doubt about the amount of time that you spent on uh, Forest Lakes research. I, I have done that myself. Uh, my biggest concern is us putting together a formal objection as, as an entity and me as an elected member of this entity not knowing anything <coughs> about it. And I didn't know anything either. Mm -hmm. So is there any concern with that? I, uh, I would like to highlight that and then see if we can figure out an actionable plan forward to inform us of these things. Uh, fair enough. I, I, like I said, I was, um, <coughs> I was given direction. Uh, and I, I think that's part of uh, me being new to a system and I just identified it. I, I probably in hindsight should have rightfully said, hey, here's the objection. Um, I, if I only Do we actually object? It, it, um, well, I was on the, I was, my, my, arching, my marching orders that was that we do object and we have to hurry up and file it to right. reserve our rights. So I think, I think that that's one issue. I think they're the kind of where I could have done better is to identify to the board, here's the objection we filed, here's what we did it, and, and here's kind of the outcome of the process. And the outcome of the process is essentially the PUD has installed. So basically the county has kind of stopped it and directed the developer to circle back with the town and, and basically, um, Generally speaking, hey, you guys need to work this out before we'll take any next actions on this on this development. Okay. 
And, and I would love an update or a summary or, or, or something on kind of what it looked like, what we said, why we said it, and where we are today. Mr. Foreman, my request to you is um, if we're putting together some sort of formal statement or position of the town as an entity, um, not just myself, but that this board is educated on what exactly we're making a decision on because at the end of the day, it's our names stamping exactly. what we're for And, and that's or my against. responsibility. And I take full responsibility for you not getting that information information um, because we were working quickly on this we so you were thrown in right at that time as well so. <laughs> I really well I but I'm not going to use that for an excuse I should have notified okay. you that's that's on me so don't blame anybody but me on that okay. one I appreciate it thank you you and, bet and I would like a copy also yes ma'am the whole board and it would one. be understandable with staff and changes that yeah. it may have been scheduled to come before us at one point yeah you never no. know yeah so um, Mayor Pro I would like to say I also don't um, uh, disagree with every penny that you've invoiced us, and, and you need to be put, your firm needs to be paid. So I'll, I'll start with that. But um, I'm thinking maybe there might need to be to not be over budget. This invoice is fifty-two hundred dollars or a little more over budget, and almost three thousand of that was from individual board member questions that you were spending time replying to that went through you, Mr. Foreman. Right. And we probably ought to come up with some sort of a uh, process to, or procedure to do this so that we are not nickeling and diming our budget to death and becoming over budget with um, information that we're requesting. Because if all seven of us did that, that would be 3,000 times seven, so $21,000 if we had that, that volume of questions going to you to go to you, Mr. Rivera. Right. So. I was just wondering if when questions come to you, Mr. Foreman, could they go to the board, perhaps via email, and we see what is a priority? I'm just trying to think how we can scale down the volume of questions going to you in order to go to you, Mr. Rivera. And if I could, if go I, ahead. They're, they're actually, um, one of the first things I asked of this board was at the December 17th meeting was to set in place a process. And, and that process um, was, was skeletal in nature and, and because it was in the beginning, but essentially it was such that if any board member had a specific request for legal advice, that request would be forwarded to the interim town manager, and then the interim town manager would basically take one of three paths. The first path would basically try to answer it himself, uh, or the second path would be to try to find and help the board member to find an answer, and the third path would be to assign it to me. Um, and, and so the, 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 the charges that you see are or those instances where the town manager assigned it to me. And some of those are pressing in nature, and I think there was a, a, a lot of, of a need for expediency um, a right, a, a kind of as a result of, the, of our quick uh, accession and, and our quick uh, nomination and our quick uh, onboarding with the town. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of this stuff, now that uh, you know, there was not the backlog anymore. I think uh, there will be an evening out, but that was the process. And certainly, I think that there is an opportunity to um, add some contours to that process so that that, that that's a, a decision um, that the board makes in combination with the town manager or or something like that. I would just like to comment on what our mayor pro tem, Ms. Elliott, has said. I think it's very important that the trustees know what questions. Or being asked. Yeah, it'd be because it's, it's, I know now is not the time or the place to ask because if they've gone through our interim town manager and gone to the next level, this is not the place. But to I like how. But I'm concerned about that at the rates that are going up because because we're not utilizing it smartly, and I don't think we want a quarter of a million dollar legal fee at the end of the fiscal year. So I, I think we have to agree to something on protocol. Yeah. Not to say that these questions aren't validated, but I think I, we need to all know. I agree. I think it's a little excessive, and <coughs> there needs to be some form of agreements on what we should be spending taxpayer dollars on. Well, I, I, this trustee can only speak for himself. I haven't asked any questions, so I'm very interested in what's being asked. <coughs> I've asked several questions as well, and they were specifically highlighted Trusty Koopman's questions on there, but I know I've sent uh, several as well, and I wasn't uh, unfortunately able to be here at the December 17th meeting. Um, I don't disagree with the, the process, and I like the kind of leaving it up to uh, Mr. Foreman to determine, hey, I'm going to answer you. Um, be able to try to help point you towards the answer or see 
I don't know if either of those are going to work. Let's go to to legal. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad approach. Um, as long as everybody's in the loop with questions, Mr. Rivera, I like how you answer the questions formally and distribute it to the full board. I think that could be something, Mr. Foreman, if you want to say, hey, this is the question, this is what I directed or guided. Um, I think we need to be mindful of our budget, but I also think as a trustee, um, certain questions uh, require legal answers. Uh, right. where you probably don't feel comfortable, Mr. Foreman, gi giving the answer to that question, exactly. uh, at which point I don't think any trustee or this board as a whole should be denied legal uh, opinion or, or guidance on anything uh, that we feel we need to have to be comfortable voting uh, on behalf of the people. So I don't know how to best work that with a budget if it's clearly a legal question that Mr. Foreman is not going to be comfortable with. Now, Mr. Foreman, I'll give you kudos on, on that process, which I didn't hear until now. Um, I had questions specific to uh, the resolution with uh, setting a, a date for this, this annexation. Uh, and Mr. Foreman tried to answer several of them. I had a few other ones. Uh, his response was, you have been doing research on this. You're going to be prepared to answer these questions at the upcoming meeting. Um, knowing that you know four thousand dollars was spent already on research on what needs to be done with the Willow Springs annexation, so you were mindful of the budget. You were mindful with actually responding instead of just ignoring it. So I appreciate that, and you were able to answer my my questions tonight. So I like the process. I don't think anything needs to change, and it sounds like it was followed, and you directed these to Mr. Rivera to answer. I did. So I don't see any of these charges as unwarranted, uh, other than. We should probably all be informed of what the questions are. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the process that I would like to review is that when a board member, any board member, gives me a set of questions, you know, we try our best to get staff to answer them, you know, that have a lot of experience in this uh, arena. But when they disagree with your answers or they're not satisfied with the answers, and then, you know, you've got a, you've got a set of questions and it's going to cost a lot of money, you know, to be able to research, have an have our attorney research and look at these, then I think I should bring those to you and say, okay, here is the set of questions. But the person who's <coughs> answering these questions has got to be comfortable with that process yeah. also. Because some of the questions they may have may be personal in nature as far as them being on the board. Understood. So well, one of the That's things we've talked about, time. you know, all the time is the quality of information. So right. maybe the questions that are being asked need to be categorized you know there's these questions on this topic and these questions on this topic and then maybe it can being consolidated and categorized will help abbreviate your time spent mm -hmm. right instead of back and forth and, and he's done that he's done that he's provided me a list and, and we've reviewed that we've also reviewed them with SIRSA and we tried to say okay SIRSA can answer these mm -hmm. we're gonna be working with CML to see if CML can, so we're, we're trying to use all the tools in the toolbox to be able to save the town as much money as possible. I think um, instead of, well, in, in regards to all of us knowing what, the, what questions are in the air without putting our legal advice out there, would it be best to share these questions in like an executive session? Maybe you collect them and then we say, okay, we're gonna have an executive session for legal counsel on this day, and we can go over some of these items. During yeah. the regular meeting? Well, During the I regular was meeting? thinking maybe yeah. that we could have a, an agenda item where we have legal questions or something like that, since Mr. Rivera's here anyway, and mm -hmm. we're paying for his time while he's here, right. that would be the optimal time to, you know, and I understand that some may require more research, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that would be the time to, uh, to, to respond and, and have him you know, do those. The reason I say that is I just don't want us to get in the habit of everybody emailing questions and you trying to get response if the board agrees this is right. a legitimate question. And, and it may be sensitive in nature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what I hear is that It might there's, take there's, 10 months to oh. get an answer. Well, and, and just, just to add to that, and I don't think this is my intent, but but I think the communication of the email and between staff and board and vice versa is kind of falling apart and maybe we can just be communicating this better. So we're not having this, well, I didn't know or you didn't know or, or and, and again, if, if the question's gonna be asked, it's gotta be important enough for the town. And 
we all need to be fiscally responsible because there's a right. lot of things that we want. So if we're not, we're just letting our constituents down. That's all we're doing. So, right. so I, I agree with what the mayor saying. What I heard is, is that if a question landed on my desk, then you will have a formal opinion that's distributed to all members. Okay. What I'm hearing, though, is there's some frustration in terms of kind of tracking all the questions and, and, and letting the board know beforehand which ones may follow my desk and then seeking guidance as to whether they, in fact, should follow my desk. Is, is that, a, is that yes. what I'm hearing? Yeah. Wait, well, wait, wait. What we discussed before was that we would go through Mr. Foreman first because he might, or the staff might be able to answer them without having to pay. This is, exactly. But I think we're referring to the questions that go beyond that. Yeah. Right. right. But exactly. Before they go to Mr. Rivera, right. Right. Mr. Rivera can tell us, hey, this one's going to take this many hours of my work at my right. cost. But, 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 but in all fairness here, it, it's it's not a matter of tracking because it's not being communicated right now. That it, it's a zero. It's not a one percent, ten percent, or twenty. It needs to be communicated to the board of what issues are being worked on or what questions are being asked within reason. Right. Um, I I can make a comment from our last meeting. I think I've received two emails, and I think those two emails were on the um, well, or the, the the luncheon that occurred on Friday. That's not good. Not when we're talking about these issues. And I can't speak for the other board members, but we just need to communicate way better. I think the process we have makes sense. Uh, I think, Mr. Foreman, you communicating to the full board uh, where you are in that process or what's driving that process, so at least we're informed, uh, rather than getting you know, the invoice and not knowing what's been worked on and what's not. What I don't want to do is get in the habit of any trustee on this board feeling that they can dictate whether another trustee uh, should be allowed uh, legal guidance in order to make the decision that we're legally tasked to do. So I, I definitely don't want to get in that habit. And I think the only way to ensure that is to keep doing what we're doing, uh, just to keep us all in the loop with where you're at. Right. Definitely. Any further comments on that? It doesn't sound like we've come to a conclusion where we can help keep the costs within budget. Well, I think it's a great idea that we could all have our questions answered at the meeting. I think it's a a good option to put it on the agenda. I think um, knowing what kind of questions we can ask and what kind of questions we shouldn't ask is important. And I also think that, um, no offense to Mr. Foreman, but uh, I still have a really hard time myself talking to someone who's not an attorney and sharing a question based on client attorney privilege. So. Um, but if it is a generic uh, situation where it's a common, commonly asked question, I'm sure that we don't have to worry about that. So is what we're saying then, or what we're suggesting, that each meeting we will have the opportunity for an executive session to ask specific questions and counsel? Is that advisable or doable? Um, it's or not executive session, it, but it's, it depends on the question. Yeah, unfortunately, because <laughs> <laughs> we would need to go to executive yeah, session. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, we can't set a determinant of questions for our attorney. Yeah, it has to be specific like legal questions. Uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be advisable to to have identified a specific legal area and and and, and, and basically no, to notice it properly. We have to okay. to to provide some insight as to. Um, so I think it would have to be done in the open public session. Yeah. I think it's a case by case. I think that I hate to. I think there's probably some that require executive session, but a vast majority don't. I suspect kind of sitting here right now and, and being forced to answer that question. But I do, so I have, we need some flexibility there. But Could I we leave that to your discretion to say, here's our, our legal guidance uh, agenda item, and you could say, I, I would, I think it's appropriate that we enter executive session to address this specific. I think that that's, that's a, fair, uh, a fair amount of guidance. I think uh, one thing that would help us, though, is that there are sometimes uh, resources available um, that are not found satisfactory. And I think that that's, that would be helpful to have some guidance there. So for example, there are some questions uh, out there that were that were identified that that um, there was some feelings that perhaps uh, the CML could provide that answer or or the CERSA training could provide that answer and, and so I, I think it would be helpful to have some guidance regarding those types of questions and, and so you know the three categories you know uh, where the staff tries to provide the answer and it's not uh, you know a, a legal question of facts to law that requires legal opinion it's more a general principle. Uh, uh, or a, a procedural question or things, something like that. And, and so these, these questions range from 
you know, very general kind of questions to very specific questions. And the more specific they come, the more likely that they should follow my desk, but some of them are, are far more general. So with, well, a couple things. Can we add a snippet to your town manager report of what town attorney, think items town attorney is working on? Yes. In the future, we can. just definitely. Hey, definitely. Mr. Rivera is working on this, this, and that way, when something comes up like Forest Lakes, Koopman can say, "What? What is that about?" And then, what if we sent our legal questions to you, Mr. Foreman, and then you and Mr. Rivera take a chance and go, "Okay, that that needs to be executive." If it requires legal opinion, that needs to be executive, that's open session, on and on. And that way we have a base for each meeting of what questions are going to be answered in executive session, what questions can be answered in open session, and what questions are going to take some excessive time to research or something along that line. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like a... Yeah, that sounds good. Even if you brought up those, anything that would take more than a couple of hours to <coughs> spot to research, that may be something that we would want to consider okay. uh, to see if it's worth the board's time overall to pursue something like that. So. Yeah, these could be a benefit to the entire board and to the town. Right. Mm -hmm. So you want to you want to take a look at that and you want to weigh the benefit versus the cost. Right. Exactly. Yep. So what, what did we determine? Where are we We'll continue to send our legal questions to Mr. Foreman. Right. Mr. Foreman will discuss with Mr. Rivera which ones need, can be answered in gotcha. uh, public session or executive session. And we can go from there. And on which ones he'll do a formal response to. Yeah, right. I, right. yeah I think there's an added piece of kind of, um, kind of a, um, a triage of kind of researching it enough to know, yeah. to, to put some um, details on it and to give some indication of how long this may take. Yeah. And then to then give yeah. that question to the board and say, do you want us to go forward or are we done? Okay. Yep. And then also add one. some of the things he's working on in my town manager's report. Correct. <laughs> Can you clarify that again for me? I didn't quite follow that. Um, so my understanding and is that basically we get a question uh, yeah, well, actually, we don't get a question. The question goes from, from the board to Mr. Foreman. Mr. Foreman is, uh, then determines, I think the process stays the same, and he determines the best way to answer that. If he determines that that question requires um, uh, uh, basically a legal opinion, then he gives it to me, and then um, I basically provide a broad category, uh, um, do my best to, to flesh it out, and then to give some indication of how long it may take to answer that question. And then that information is presented to the board, and then the board provides further directions as to uh, basically answer it or not. Okay, and I, I, I think, though, we need to cover, like, urgent situations. What do you do for an urgent situation? And what how what do we determine urgent, right? right. Yeah, if there's an urgent situation, it I should think. be coming from the town manager. Right. But <laughs> um, that might be true. But we should have some kind of system in place where, where if we have a, a board issue coming up that, you know, new people really don't understand the ramifications of and need to ask a question and uh, need an answer pretty rapidly, then we need to set up a situation like, what will we do for that? Well, that's under the assumption that the answer can come quickly, you know, if right. you can come up. Uh, if he can answer the, I would say, if you can answer the question in half an hour, then go ahead and answer it. But if it's one of those things that's going to take a large amount of research, that kind of defeats the purpose of urgency because, by definition, you got to mm -hmm. do the research. And do we have a spending limit or on questions without us all approving or something like that? Too? That's I mean, well, he said a half an hour. Well, well, yeah. That's, yes. So do, um, go ahead. I, I was just, are you, I had a different topic there. I was just going to say, so do we do what we just outlined? If a, a hypothetical comes up where it's urgent, you're not getting the answer in a timely fashion that you feel, express that, say, I feel this is an urgent thing, at which point the board can be notified that it's an urgent thing or something like that? Sounds fine. I mean, is that adequate? Well, yeah. Right. I mean, what we don't want to do is hold complete conversations about what is urgent, what is not, what is this, what is that. 
I, I think it's, 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 it puts us in a difficult position of determining what's urgent. Yeah. Um, I think mm -hmm. that. Well, maybe the to, trustee to, could mark it urgent. But if that's going to result in three thousand dollars, I think it needs court approval. Absolutely. So how are we going to? Well, then, then it's no longer urgent because three thousand dollars means he's got to spend time on it to get you know to do the research. So. So if it's more than thirty minutes of estimated work, can you let us know? Um. I think the one thing that we're all forgetting here is that if you do determine it's urgent and it is going to cost a lot of money, and we bring that item to the board, you always have the ability to say, "I need more information." At that time, you have the ability to say, I need more information. You could put it off till the next week. And then at that time, we could determine whether or not we're going to give him that item. And I think that there's an important component here, which is um, whether it's a broad interest. I think that that's kind of the unspoken right. issue here is, yeah. is that it, mm -hmm. it could be, we could put the meat on the bones, present it to you, and then it still could, and it could be going forward because there is broad interest, or it could be uh, denied because there's not, it's not a broad interest. And so I, I think that this is still a work in progress, and I, and I think that uh, it would be difficult to solve both the problem of, I guess it would be better to think of this as a work in progress, and, and let's try to solve one problem at a time. And maybe we solve the problem first of what, uh, how to figure out those questions which are, uh, that are of broad interest and those that are not. And then maybe once we get that process settled a little bit, we'll figure out how to add the added complexity of urgency or not. Uh, that would be my suggestion, because I think it's, it's difficult for a process to, to evolve dealing with two variables at the same time. That sounds reasonable. Like, you know, I think the Forest Lakes was an isolated case. It was something that had to be done. It's just, it, it, it just missed the communication, and, and we're putting it on the same level. I think right now there's questions, because this process is getting very, mm -hmm. very confusing. Mm -hmm. If there's questions, it goes to the interim town manager. We have a meeting. I'll tell you, in my six, almost seven years, see one or two nine one ones. I think the mayor goes, I'm getting, he's getting, can agree with that. So so I, I, I think we do it that way. It comes to a meeting, we can talk about general. If it's something touchy, we have an executive session. And we're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Makes sense? Good. Mm -hmm. it's good direction. Yes. yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. We've got a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Ms. Smith? Ms. Smith, did you have? Uh, just a reminder that because this was pulled off of the consent agenda, I need you all to vote on its own payment. We didn't pull it off not approving it. We oh. just pulled it off as a, yeah, as a discussion item. It's considered discussion. approved on the consent agenda. It is considered okay. approved. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, because I had dealt with Alicia Corley when we were dealing with the IGA when I was on the Metro District and that she was a town attorney. Uh, on on salary, and then uh, and this has nothing to do with you, Mr. Ricks. I'm very pleased with you and the service you're doing. This is more of a budgeting mm -hmm. question, of course. Okay, so when you guys, prior to me getting sworn in, were in the process of getting Mr. Rivera and everything, um, I wasn't sure how the discussions with y'all that were here went as far as not having a town attorney. But from a budgeting point of view, was discussion the discussions happen as to what the potential cost would be from having. Uh, hourly versus having somebody on staff and do we see that with potential legal issues that this could cost more than having somebody on staff or not or I get all depends on if we continue to have issues uh, but, but, but uh, uh, given the past four and a half years I, w I would imagine that's going to continue okay um, but as Kelly said I think we're about 5,000 over what we predicted budget wise you know for that and I think we were going to review you know at the end of the year to kind of see what right. makes sense it, and what, what doesn't, it, right? Is, is that what you guys have discussed I believe, at the end of the year? I believe we budgeted the same as we had as for the, the salary. Okay. The salaried employee. Is that correct? We haven't budgeted the salary for the town attorney, no. That's not under the salary for 2019. It's a line item for legal under every department. Mm -hmm. oh, so you oh, broke, okay. you broke, broke it out. Legal fees up over okay. department. Right. That's right. And that that total. Do you remember what the total <coughs> amount was? What is that? Do you remember what the total amount was? Uh, I can let you know. I'd have to go through each department and add it up. It'd be, it'd be good to know. But I mean, I think uh, we're we're kind of in a, a territory we're exploring uh, how this is going to work. Um, in, in all fairness, we knew Forest Lakes was coming sooner or later. We knew this for years, so it just happened to happen. Welcome, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to so, be messy. So I, I think we beat a dead horse. Mm -hmm. so. 
yeah. on this. Yeah. We have a solution. Trustee Romanello, are you yeah, good with yeah. that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion items before we move on? No. Seeing none. Public comments for items not on the agenda. Please keep your comments to three minutes. Do we have any public comments? Sir. Good evening. Barry Molnar. Um, won't be given an address in the, in the open form. My wife is a detective, so just being clear on that. And that will sign in. We, as a town of Monument folks, um, voted in seven individuals up here that comprise of a board. I was a little concerned back there sitting and listening when we started talking about each individual, if you all have a question on the legal side of the house because you have a requirement to um, vote um, for things as you know they are to follow the law, obviously, based off of everything else overall. <laughs> I want to caution you all um, very much so about coming together and overriding an individual's that we have voted in uh, an individual's right to make sure uh, or, or to proceed with a question. I, I'm 100% I, um, against any kind of majority denial of, of legal, legal counsel and legal information. I just want to make all that clear, and I hope you all understand where a slippery slope that this could turn into. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Walmart. you very much. Anne Hell. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of things. I came before this board not to feel as the uh, town clerk has recorded in the minutes, but to state fact that the Sunshine Laws were violated when you called an executive session to discuss the Board of Trustees. It explicitly says that you cannot call an executive session for an elected official. I asked the attorney to respond to that. He said he would. I have yet to receive a response. So that's one. We've seen here tonight where it seems to be very convenient for you guys to call an executive session. I ask you to go familiarize yourself with the Sunshine Laws. There are very specific reasons when you go into executive session and when that is acceptable. It is not just for the convenience of the board and it's not just because a lawyer is present. It's very clear on that matter. So <coughs> consider when you want to jump into executive session, because some municipalities have lost that ability to go into an executive session because they've abused it. Next is, there are very clear ordinances that a trustee must live within the town limits. Mr. Romanello does not. He continues to live outside the town limits. There is no clause whatsoever talking about intent to return to a place of residence. This has been more than 90 days. You have to do that for your driver's license if you live and you move to a different location. I want the board to respond to this. It is unacceptable. You are in clear violation of Monument Town Ordinance and Colorado State Law. It just is beyond me that you cannot read and follow simple laws. So please respond to that. Thank you. Do we have anybody else that would like to make public comment? Seeing none, I'll move on. 
Mr. Foreman, town manager report, was there anything you would like to add to that? No, sir, I don't think so. Um, I will take it under advisement that we're going to add um, Mr. Rivera's comments in the future, so I'll add another comment, another uh, column on there for legal issues. Uh, yeah. But I'll entertain any questions that you have on my report. Would you like to add this to oh, any report? Yes, I would. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me find that that you're talking about. I'll put it up. <coughs> I did. Okay. Uh, one of the things that me and Mr. Rivera are working on is uh, finding a town prosecutor. And uh, he was able to bring me one. Today, we uh, interviewed her and talked to her. Her name is Carrie Pina Loza. I've uh, given you her resume. Everybody has her resume in front of you. She currently works for the city of Edgewater, uh, I think part-time, correct? Yep, and she's also a Centennial City Council member, um, District 2, from January 2016 to the present. I interviewed her today, had a great conversation with her, feel like that she would fill this role. Uh, I was very impressed with her. Uh, philosophy on prosecution and the fact that you know the one thing I ask her not to do is to you know I, I want her to you know review each case and and make sure that we respond to them in the in the manner that will make law enforcement respect us as a town and so uh, one of the things that I think I heard was that we were having some issues with you know let's make a deal kind of stuff and so she's not that kind of prosecutor she is going to listen and, and and determine whether or not what the facts are and stuff like that and present those to the judge and so I was very impressed with uh, her philosophy and where did you say she was referred from again this man's okay. she, firm uh, she uh, subcontracts with our firm and she provides uh, part-time municipal prosecution uh, services to uh, several clients, uh, several municipalities throughout the state. Our clients that, for whom she provides these services are the city of Edgewater and the city of Wheat Ridge. We, where is Edgewater, please? It's um, it's actually um, in Denver, and it's yeah. one of those uh, areas that are indistinguishable from Denver unless you're aware. Of it. uh, it's basically <laughs> between 19th and 26th um, on the east side of Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> and the good thing about it, she does live in Centennial, so it's not very far for her to drive here. And Is so, there any way we can get more than one option? Uh, I think he was able to have several options and looked at them. That your direction was to have him look at them and uh, present me with some options, and so I was able I would to just like more than one. Um, you know, it's, it's not a large pool out there, so. Right. Um, I, I, I guess I, if, if you'd like me to try to find some more, I, I could try to, but I'm not sure I would be successful. It's not three. Three options. Is there a, do you have an issue with his option? I mean, that's the direction we gave him, too. Was I here? Oh, maybe you weren't. I'm sorry. I'm so not opposed to different options. Um, when you have one, it's not really an option. Fair enough. So, I mean, two. Okay. I, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> if you can. I mean, <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <clears throat> Any other questions for the town manager? Thank you. You bet. This. You bet. Thank you. Is there anything, I mean, is this kind of the standard that you want to see and continue and stuff like that? I want to make sure that report. on the town <laughs> manager's great. report. The detail is great. Good. And I want, to, I want to let you know that Ms. Hogan has been very helpful in helping me put this together, and, and uh, I want to give her kudos for helping me with how it's put together and how it looks. So a lot better than my first one, I think. So thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> I, I, I just had one question. It, it's a curiosity. Um, based on the prosecutor and when court is held and what have you, and whatever fee is determined, put that aside. Are we also responsible, or is that up for discussion? Do we pay for commute time to and fro, whatever their home base is? Yes, we do. We do. Yeah. Yep, that's one option. And that's why she's only 30 minutes from here. Okay. So that's that so was one a good, <coughs> very good business sense, having a good reference and close. Right. Exactly. And yeah. you both felt comfortable. Definitely did. Yes. Definitely did. She, she interviewed very well. She, she provides the service for our present clients and has done so for, I believe, uh, approximately 10 years or so. Okay. Okay. Board authorization items. 
Ms. Hogan, Tri Lakes Views. Yeah, I actually have three, if you'll bear with me. But the first one is that Tri Lakes Views is requesting that they deliver to the board at some time in the near future their annual presentation. Okay. You've probably remembered it. Um, it's almost every spring that they deliver a short presentation. Okay. Did they have a date they were shooting for? Or? They were fine with anything that. Uh, I like April. Is it in August? April? How does April sound to the board? That's fine. First meeting in April. Okay. And then the um, Triview Metropolitan District number three would like to <coughs> present a resolution for the board to appoint directors to fill vacancies on their board of directors. They would like to do that on uh, February 19th, the next meeting. What, what date? February 19th, the next meeting. And this is another revisit one. That's one that this we one had has seen come before the board. Those are the ones who wanted to put the developers as part of the board. Yes, and maybe yeah. Mr. <coughs> can speak a little bit to that. They contacted him with the details. Uh, yes, this is one of the projects that were wait, awaiting me when I, I came on board. Um, essentially, uh, the metropolitan, um, the, the district. I'm actually sure with their their into their tri view, and uh, I have to look at my email to get their exact name. But basically, they were. Um, not operable for a, fair, a period of time and they want to because of the economy as I understand and now they want to become operable and in order to begin operation to begin developing they need the board and their bylaws require that at least one or two <coughs> members of their board be appointed by the board of trustees for the town of monument and that's why they're uh, asking to be on the agenda on February 19th so so I have a question can we approve a board prior to a development that hasn't come to us yet for <coughs> that approval uh, I, I, I'm confused because that was the topic last time when they came to us mm -hmm. it's regarding home place ranch if I'm correct but well, I think it was the fact that they were landowners they, they, were, <coughs> yeah, they, they so were randomly so picked people by the by, by the developer yeah it's, it's it's somewhat of the cart before the horse which was of confusion mm -hmm. so and, but, and I believe that remains to be the case but I can research that and pro provide that information to I, you yeah I I'm only one person, but I'd, I'd like to see it researched. I'm think, not saying no. I think we need some clarification on yes. how it works. Cause, cause it's but I also believe that we're fine with it being on the agenda. Yeah. I, I, would, I would like the clarification first, just so we're not continually doing do-overs. Just, just we're following correct protocol. <coughs> I would agree with that. Ms. Hogan, can we possibly move it to the first meeting in March? We, we um, or is there a time restriction? They, they actually have a time restriction. What I can do, though, is um, as, as basically ask them the question that was presented to me, and that's my understanding as well, is that they were inoperable for a fairly long period of time, and now they're trying to basically get, get the engine started again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the first step in doing that is having board members. So if, if there are some concerns from the board members about you know being a part of this process at this point, then I think that they're in the best position to answer that. And I think that it would be preferable to have them here and, and answer that question, Frank. But, but, but my, my comment that I made <coughs> when they did come, when I made the comment of the cart before the horse, that representative agreed. <coughs> so I don't know what's transpired between, I, I, I would just like better clarification, just, just so make a good decision. What I can do is make sure that, you know, invite them to, to provide information that will be available in your packets and then, and then, yeah. and then have them present if that would be sufficient. It's, I don't think I anything's think, changing from I think the prior. What we're, I think what we're, what Trustee Bornstein's possibly looking for is a, some feedback from you on how this works. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, just just so we, we know the procedure. Okay. And, and I understand them creating to operate, but it's, it's again, and we know what they're going to operate, but that hasn't even come to us yet. Got it. So it's just, just following step one, two, three, rather than one, three, two. That, that's all. I understand. And I was, I had a question. Um, do, if we have to appoint those members, do we get a choice of who, do we get a choice there too of who we can appoint? Could you put that in your okay. research? Thank you. Or if there's any eligibility requirements for those appointed. Yes, okay. guidelines. Okay. I'll make sure I give them a call tomorrow morning. So, Ms. Hogan, that stands with stands at February 19th. <coughs> um, I have a third. No, Sorry. I thought we were going to postpone until we get. No, they, time he's going to get it before then. 
And if we don't have a legal response and if yeah, anybody's comfortable, then we can say thanks for coming and we can postpone. Right. Yeah, you're on your own. You, you retain your discretion. Yeah. You got an um, additional item, Ms. Hogan? Yes. The um, training that we had scheduled with Sam Light with, um, from SIRSA, he was obviously going to come down at the last board meeting, which was canceled. Mm -hmm. So he is available um, just before our next board meeting, February 19th, from 5.30 to 6.30. I'm hoping that works. We're also <coughs> going to invite the Board of Adjustment and the Planning Commission. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that worked for the board. 530 work for the board? I will make it work. I predict our next snowstorm on February. <laughs> 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 Here's that that'll work, Ms. Holmes. Thank you. That's the 19th because it's President's Day is Monday. Correct. Yeah. So that's a Correct. Tuesday? It's a yes. Tuesday. Any other board authorization items? Okay, I would like to ask for one. I'd like to do an executive session the next meeting to move forward with our discussion on a town manager, a personnel matter, and we can get any sort of legal advice we might need. Any agreements? Sounds good. Can you add that to the next agenda? Yes. So that will be on the 19th as well. So we're going to have yes. this 5.30 to 6.30, and then the meeting and an executive session. So I'll pack a lunch. Dinner. Dinner. <laughs> I'll bring chicken noodle soup, guys. We're we moving go. on. Board of Trustee comments. Trustee Cooper? Uh, I just want to, I guess, give a kudos and, and say that I'm, I'm really excited to hear about potential uh, regional efforts uh, with our, our neighboring communities to possibly partner with CSU and their their uh, efforts surrounding the new visitor center at Northgate. Uh, so great job, Tom, everybody in the team for, for working on those regional efforts. Um, I know Mr. Foreman, you've been involved with those as well. So uh, keep working together. I mean, that, that truly is the future is, is coming together as a community, uh, which isn't just the town of Monument. So uh, good job. Great to hear. Excited. Tom, Tom's doing a great job leading that. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to say the presentations tonight, I thought they were very good and very informative and it's really showing a vision of where we're heading and since it's only February 4th, I think we've got a good running start for January and uh, I appreciate the participation of the board. If my HOA president would approve it, I would take the arch, it's in monument, but it might back. I don't think that he will, so we'll, we'll let Tom take it down. I just have some questions based on the last meeting when uh, questions were asked about Monument Ordinance 2.04.020, qualifications to run for a trustee. And I compared it with the CRS 3110201. And I noticed there was a great deal of uh, variation. And I think that um, some of the Monument Ordinance conflicts with the state law it looks like that um, this ordinance was written in the past to prevent the trustees from not residing within the town of monument during the term of their office or a year prior to the cert to their service whereas the um, state law says that they have to reside in the state for 22 days immediately preceding the election and I think that um, uh, it just appeared that the authors of the ordinance were attempting to add to the, add a more, um, I don't, I hate to say the word legalistic, but I'm going to use it, uh, a more legalistic approach to this uh, uh, conflict with the original uh, state law. And I'm just wondering, since everyone else has been on the board way longer than I have, if there were... Uh, does anybody recollect when this ordinance was written and why? Hmm. 
<clears throat> because the problems I see here are shall move from or become uh, in the ordinance itself. It says each candidate shall have been a resident of the town for a period of at least 12 consecutive months immediately preceding the date of election or appointment and shall be a qualified elector of the town. If any elected board member shall move from, and that move shall move from or become during their term of office a non-resident of the town, they shall be deemed thereby to have vacated the office upon the adoption by the Board of Trustees of a resolution declaring such vacancy to exist. So I see that there's a problem with this shall move from or become line and another one with uh, we made it 12 months versus 22 in a 22 days and I would just like to move to have the ordinance revised or to more accurately reflect the wording in the statute. Um, I might be able to offer a little bit of a clarification on not that whole concept, but the 22 days is actually a requirement for residency to vote in Colorado. Mm -hmm. What you're quoting, the 22 days is how long you have to live in the state of Colorado to be eligible to vote. So are you familiar with the requirement for um, running for election then? How long you have to be here? You have to reside in the town for 12 months prior to the election. And that's the state, state law? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'd still like to take a look at this ordinance and see if we can make it move, uh, shall move from or become. Mayor, I, th I think this is one of those cases that we just discussed that probably you should come to me and, and go to Mr. Rivera and we'll come back to you with an answer. Okay. Um, if that's the board's that. wishes. On what? On looking at the ordinance? Yes. We're reviewing You're the trying ordinance. to revise the ordinance? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's a big one. I, I know that, but I mean I didn't understand what you said. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I said this is kind of the process that we were just talking about and just set up, and so this would be a case in where the board would instruct me to take this to Mr. Rivera and we'd come back to you in the future with an answer. Can we say, Trustee Clark, could you type up for Mr. Foreman the question and, yeah. and your I'll concerns? Do I'll do that. Right. You can. <clears throat> Make sure we all know what those questions are, <laughs> and then consult with Mr. Rivera, time and all that stuff. Because otherwise, I think this creates quite a bit of public confusion. Like when we were here last time, you had said, "Oh yeah, it would be okay for me to move to Denver and still govern from this seat." Well, I have this incredible offer for nine hundred thousand dollars a year in Denver, and if I move to Denver, it would be it'd be hard for me to um, go back and forth like that. So is that really applicable that I could move to Denver? Uh, would your home still be here, though, was the question. I would keep, I would, I'm a realtor. I, I always keep all my houses. <laughs> so, so. Um, but I would like to know if I, if I kept my home residence here or my primary residence here and bought another house in Denver and moved there to work, am I still okay sitting on this seat? I, I really need to know that for myself. I mean, 900000 a year is hard to turn down. I think you kind of answered that was saying that you'd still be a resident here. Well, she didn't no, I'll be here. living in Denver, but I'll come back on the meetings, et cetera, and still keep my but house here. But your residence is still going to be here. Her question is with the, at least how I understand it, is with the shall move from. What's yes. your biggest concern? Shall move because from. Shall move from or become a non-resident. Mm -hmm. But she just said she wasn't. She was going to live down there, but she was not going to. So that's where the vagueness is. Well, what is moving from? Yeah, what is moving from? I need a definition for that. Seriously. I would think it would be changing your residency. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I have a, I have a great I have a great deal of uh, not understanding of this monument ordinance, and I was wondering if anyone on the board. <clears throat> knew when it was written and who wrote it because perhaps they were trying to stop uh, problems from happening and they made it a little more um, legalistic to ensure there wasn't any problems. Were you on the board back then, Mayor Wilson? Not for this ordinance. How about how about you, Trustee Bornson? I You know what, I, I cannot recall. I, I don't think I was. To be very I think it was before the, my time. Yeah, doesn't the ordinance number represent part of the date? So yeah, it would take me a little bit to look it up, but so 
2.04.020. So it was either an 02 or a 04, I'm guessing. In 2004? The, it appears to me in, that the ordinance is actually broader than the statute. It's not specifying anything. It's actually less specific. Um, and if you give me a minute, I can tell you when that one was. But you can continue on with your discussion. Sorry. 2013. Well, I there think. There you go. 2013. Robert's got it. 2013. 2013? That's, That's not what I thought. Hmm. So there's nothing in this number that reflects that? No, I guess not. Okay. So it's 2013. So was anybody here in 2013? Yeah, at the end of the ordinance number, it says 2013. So it's 02, And that's just the last time that particular section was updated via ordinance. So, right. so then you have to go back further to find the original? Well, a lot of times this stuff does take quite a bit of research to figure out at what time, what portions were changed, yes. Wow. So going, getting back to the original <coughs> would probably be the best thing to look at. The original? I guess it depends on what your goal is. I think having a discussion in executive session to answer your question is probably the easiest way to get the details I don't need, you want. I don't need an executive session for it. I no. just I just want to know. Send, send me your question specifically. I'll get that I'll to Joe that. and we'll, we'll get back with you. Um, additional board comments? I just want to mention that over on the, Jack the Jackson Creek area, the Homestead Homeowners Association is having their annual meeting next Wednesday. I think it's at Bear Creek Elementary. Uh, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because Triview Metro District is going to provide an update there at that meeting. <coughs> when was the meeting? Next Wednesday for the Homestead HOA. But it's an open meeting. People can show up. Okay. Any other comments? Do you know where it's going to be? Bear Creek Elementary. Thanks, I'm sorry. <coughs> Seeing no other comments, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 They're adjourned. Aye. <laughs> 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 I feel bad about being old. <laughs> No, they said you're not with me, or why are you trying to say it to me? Joe Rivera. Thank you.